Networking with like-minded business people sounds like a good idea. Today, we explore the benefits of joining a Chamber of Commerce. Then, ever wonder how long your money will last? We share some ways to make sure it does. And we look at how to eat better for less. All this and more, right now on The Wealthy Life. Welcome to The Wealthy Life. What do Chambers of Commerce do and can you benefit? With us today is Bruce Williams, CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce to discuss. Bruce, welcome. Thank you, Sybil, nice to see you. So when did you first get involved in the Chamber and why? Uh, I've been involved at Chambers across the country in various places I've lived. The reason is that the Chamber is the voice of business. The Chamber is a, a place where people can meet, they can network with each other, they can take advantage of discounts and benefits offered by other members. Uh, but it's a place to really get a handle on what your economy looks like, where the, the voice of business and the presence of business in a community is defined by Chambers of Commerce. And in some places they're known as a board of trade, but it's the same thing. It's a place where businesses can connect and you can make up a lot of ground by entering an organization like the Chamber. Ours, for example, has 1,400 member businesses. It would be very difficult to find those 1,400 people anywhere else than somewhere like a Chamber. So the networking part of it's very important. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and it's by membership, is it not? Correct. And so who would become a member and why? Well, all sectors are represented in Chambers of Commerce and Boards of Trade. Uh, it's, as I said, uh, the networking part of it is great. It also means that we can represent their points of view when we do uh, advocacy with government. So you know. think of a, an example from a few years ago. Something come to mind? Uh, yeah, when we were dealing with uh, things like the pandemic, when that was much more of a thing back in March of 2020 and into 2021, mm -hmm. um, people needed an understanding of what the government benefit programs actually meant to them. How does it impact their employees? What can they access? What do they qualify for? What if they file for something and they find out that they don't qualify? Are they going to be penalized? How long should they have continued? What should they have meant to employers? All of those things can be answered by a chamber, which we can then impart on our members. So we can wow. make, we can then take their information back to government and say, here's what business thinks should be happening. And I'll mention that the majority of our members and in most boards of trades and, and chambers of commerce, in our case, 85% of our member companies have less than 10 employees. So these are small business owners. That's right. They wouldn't otherwise probably have a voice as loud as the voice of a chamber of commerce. So we represent their best interests. So it's a resource group. It's a support group. It's got networking benefits, but also more than that, it's an advocacy group. So the voices of all the members, the chamber then collectively can push forward as an advocacy group to make public change. Correct. And it depends on where you are in Canada or in the world for that matter. Chambers of Commerce and Boards of Trade can represent different advocacy priorities. Um, the way to look at what advocacy priorities would be is to take a look at any sort of an election campaign on a provincial or a federal level. The things that pop up as the major issues are the ones that are of concern to business because those are the ones that are speaking to government to say, this is what you need to consider doing. This is what we would like you to do to take a look at. So. For example, you and I are on the west coast of Canada. British Columbia has a very high priority on climate change and change mitigation. Mm -hmm. Good That's, cause. Th yes, but not quite as high a priority for other places. For example, our neighbors in Alberta would not put quite as high a priority on that, but they have other things that matter more to them. So chambers of commerce and boards of trade are very much reflective of the community in which they exist. Great. Now, what about people who are not business owners? Can they benefit? Absolutely, because what we do has a great impact on the governance policies of government. So when we do advocate on behalf of the community in general, whether you're a chamber member or not, you would benefit from that. And we also work with businesses to make sure that they remain strong so that if someone, for example, is not a chamber member, but their employer is or their company is, mm -hmm. that's to their benefit. That means that they have the ability to sustain their job and create prosperity for everybody. Great. And how about events? How often do people get together and does the chamber put, put on all types of events to bring people together? Yep, sure do. We do, uh, our chamber in particular does probably a couple of them a month on a pretty regular basis. It's a hybrid going forward. Uh, as we all got to know what uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom means, <laughs> it actually had some advantage that in those kinds of events, people who couldn't normally attend can do so because they don't have to physically Physically be there. So a hybrid exists of in-person events and uh, events that are done virtually. But yeah, that's where you meet and you mingle and you talk
talk to other people and you make connections and you see someone across the room per perhaps you don't know, you go to them and say, hi, I'm Sybil and I do the wealthy life and I do, uh, and that's how you connect with people. So in person, that's the benefit of it. That's great. Now, what does it cost? Is it expensive to join? Is there different packages available? How much do you have? No, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it varies from chamber, and cha chamber to chamber and board of trade to board of trade. In smaller communities, it's usually a flat fee. Um, of X number of dollars. In our case, we have a tiered program. Uh, so we have uh, zero to 10 employees, 11 to 25 employees, and it goes on that level. And the larger the company, uh, the more they pay in a fee. It, but, but if you pay more as a larger company, does that mean all of your employees can attend different events? It does. Uh, it also means that you have more of a weighted vote in decisions made by the chamber. So when we have, for example, an AGM, we vote on a policy, uh, the larger employers have a weighted vote. It's kind of the same model that would be used in a regional government where smaller municipalities have X number of votes, but the larger municipalities have even more votes to reflect the impact of that community, sorry, that, uh, that municipality on the community. So yeah, it's a weighted vote in our case, but in, in many of the smaller ones across the country, which most of them are, it's a flat fee. Now, if someone just wants to support the great work of the chamber, but is not a business owner, can they just make a donation? Is that something that happens? Sure, or just get involved. You know, uh, call your local chamber manager or board of trade manager and ask them what they're doing, what's going on, how can I be involved, how could I support you, and then how could you support me? Uh, I think you'd be surprised at the impact that the chamber actually has in day-to-day -day life. And the last thing I want to quickly cover before we're out of time is health and dental benefits. Is there some perks that come along with yeah. that for chamber members? Yeah, it, uh, the chamber across the country has the ability to access that for its members, and therefore it can very often be more affordable for an employer. So a small employer who may not have the capacity to do uh, what they would like to fully do for their employees, by going through the chamber plan, they can offer those benefits to their employees, which is a perk saying to somebody, I can offer you a job, oh, and by the way, you get benefits with the job. That helps with retention of employees. Bruce, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And when we return, investing for higher returns with downside protection after the break. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. And welcome back. Curious to know how long your money will last? Joining us today is financial advisor, Christian Yane Krybaum to share a few ways to ensure your money lasts longer than you do. Christian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for inviting me to the show. Well, nobody wants to outlive their money, but they also don't wanna leave a ton left over for someone else maybe. What are some of the common challenges investors face when making sure their money lasts long enough? The biggest challenge is they sometimes underestimate how long they may live because in today's technology and medicine advancement, people may live longer. And when you live too long, you may run out of money. Oh my gosh, you mean I might live to be 110? <laughs> I didn't say it, but you know, see people live longer Could these happen. days. We all know that, you know. <laughs> Which is fine as long as you've got enough money and income to last you to 110. But if you run out of money at 95, oops, there's a problem. Yes, because many people these days, they rely on GICs, which many years ago paid 15%. But today, if you get 2%, you are unlucky and your RIF money or retirement money may outlive you. And so what are some things people can do to make sure they don't outlive their money? Uh, the, consider options like outside the normal GIC, guaranteed investment certificates. There are insurance solutions like annuities, which is like a, a yearly pension for the rest of your life or a new product from about 10 years ago, GMWB, or in other words, guaranteed minimum withdrawal balance, which is basically a hybrid between annuity with guaranteed income for life and the flexibility of a mutual fund portfolio. So your money is not per se locked in. Well, let's talk a little bit about the annuity. How does an annuity work? It's basically, you give them, for instance, $100,000, and depending from you are female or male, you get your money for the rest of your life. You cannot essentially outlive your money. The only downside is when you have an annuity, you're locked in. So when you have a GMWD product or a guaranteed minimum withdrawal product, uh, you're not locked in. You have the flexibility, access to money if needed. And people right. like this idea. Yeah, so with an annuity, if I give 100000 me being a female, does that mean I get more or less than if I was a male? 
Uh, this is a touchy subject because females <laughs> usually get less money because statistics-wise they live longer, so insurance companies have to do some kind of number crunching. So as a male, you have this, unfortunately, advantage to get more income uh, when you have an annuity. But then that money I put into an annuity, it's locked in. You get your income for life, but you can't access the capital ever again. It's, it's uh, there. So tell, tell absolutely. us a little bit more about the guaranteed option you were just referring to. What is a typical average rate of return or what determines the rate of return on that type of investment and how much income you can pull out? I tell our clients, first of all, we should meet over two, three meetings. It's a product with lots of bells and whistles, but the bottom line is uh, you put money in and depending from your age, you get higher or lower income. But the beauty is with this product, if you put some money in, say with 55, and you wait until 65, these products give you like an annual bonus. So essentially, you can increase your income down the road. So this is a beautiful side effect. The longer you wait, the higher income you receive down the road. Okay, so this type of investment, you put your money in, it will give you a guaranteed increase every year between now and retirement for the yep. purposes of calculating that guaranteed income coming out when you need it for as long yep. as you live. So what if I live to 120? Will it keep paying me? The, yeah, if you don't, over, they have this kind of minimum withdrawal amount. If you don't access this, you live as long as possible. They pay you and they pay you and they pay you. Similar to Canada Pension Plan, they pay as you live. So if we look at this guaranteed investment, guaranteed withdrawal benefit, why would that be better than maybe a bond or a GIC portfolio? It usually pays higher rates. It is backed by big insurance companies. Uh, and, and you have a higher protection versus a normal bank investment. So it's flexibility. And the beautiful side effect is it has beautiful, nice estate transfer benefits. So you, you basically have several products or in, uh, in one product together. So Christian, what's the downside? Who is this type of investment not suitable for? It's not suitable for those people who see the internal product as a gross portfolio because there are more fees attached, but as you may know, guarantees cost money. So for those people who would like to have a higher component of fixed income, a guaranteed withdrawal benefit program is a beautiful alternative to GICs or corporate bonds, B, A, because of the flexibility, and B, of the higher return or higher uh, net guaranteed income for the life. Christian, that's fantastic. It sounds like people need to make an appointment with their advisor to learn more. Thanks for being on the show today. You're welcome. My pleasure. And up next, learn how to eat better for less money. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. Do you want to save money on your food bill? Here with us today is nutrition coach Shannon Naylor to discuss with us how you can eat better for less. Ooh, that sounds great. <laughs> Shannon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So what does it mean to eat better? So I think to eat better, I think we immediately think it means like I have to eat healthier, I have to only eat apples and salad, but really eating better is gonna be eating what's best for you. So it's very individual and it causes us to kind of look at what we currently eat, what do we want to be eating and what maybe should we be eating to fuel our body. So it doesn't have to be boring. It can be no. fun, good, nutritious, 100%. exciting meals. Absolutely, and I think it really, looks at what do you like to eat and build from there. Like, don't be afraid to get fun with it, to look up new recipes, that sort of thing. And then as soon as we add in, like there's so many fruits and vegetables out there that taste delightful, um, you know, add in fun and flair to all those kinds of foods. That's what's going to get you excited about the meals. You're going to want to eat that less tempted to eat out somewhere, which we do know is not only going to hurt our wallets, but probably hurt our waistline a little bit too as well. So is it generally more expensive to eat healthier? I think it's a little bit of a misconception. I think the biggest thing I would say to that is plan ahead. So when we plan, we're less likely to have food waste. We're less likely to eat out as well as also have gone to the grocery store. So that adds up also. So when we take that time, you know, maybe 10 minutes a week, 
honestly. Really, it's that quick? And honestly, it's probably gonna get faster the more that you get into the routine of it. So when you sit down, you think, okay, what do I have in my pantry already? What sort of things do I like to eat? Plan that out and just take that time. You get your grocery bill, off you go to the grocery store, you know exactly what you need, how much you need of it. So then when it comes to Friday, you're not tossing things out of the fridge and wasting food. Oh, I've done that. And right? it makes me feel sick to my stomach. I feel, oh no, I didn't eat this before it turned. Yeah. And if I had just been planning a little bit more ahead, I would have saved money, but I also wouldn't have had that waste. Exactly. And so I think it's going to, you know, be better in the long run for you. It's just, you know what, maybe one morning on a Saturday morning, you wake up, you have your cup of coffee, you sit down, you write your grocery list, you think about your week ahead. So tell me about your week ahead. What would a meal planning week look like for you, Shannon? On a Friday, I will think about the next week. And also what I do is I take a look what is on the schedule for that week. So, you know, for me, okay, do I have a meeting after work? Um, am I meeting with a client? Do I need to pack a snack? Those different things as well is gonna impact what am I gonna have that week? So thinking about all that and laying it out also then allows me to take that plan put it into a grocery list. I'll know, okay, maybe I'm having oatmeal for breakfast one day. I'll pick up some eggs and so maybe I'll have eggs the next day. So it doesn't also have to be boring and repetitive. You can also have different meals throughout the week. Um, if you like that, some people like to eat the same thing every day, no harm against that, but some people like to have variety. Mm -hmm. So taking that 10 minutes on, you know, for me, it's a Friday night. I plan my grocery list, Saturday's grocery shopping day, yep. and then Sunday when I'm watching football, I will meal prep. Okay, what does meal prep look like? Set aside some time. So usually, to be honest, you're probably looking at, you know, maybe an hour to two hours, but you can spread that out how you like because you're chopping vegetables. Um, it could also be shorter than that. I, you know what I really love, especially as we're getting to the fall season, is just taking a pack of chicken throwing it in the crock pot, adding some broth, some seasoning. I toss that off to the side. That does its thing for a couple hours. Um, the same time, maybe I'll put on some rice, um, chop up some vegetables. And so because the vegetables are already chopped, I don't have to cook them that day. Maybe I'm not having them, but they're already pre-packaged in the fridge. So, you know, for lunch, maybe I'm making a salad. Dinners, maybe some a stir fry. Pull it out of the fridge, toss it in the pan. I already have my chicken prepped because I already did that in the crock pot. Throw so the chicken in. organized, but it's great. And I, I can see how if you spend a little bit of time that one day a week, you've saved so much time the rest of the week. And we know time is money as well. And Absolutely. what happens when people don't prepare or they're out of time? They go hit a fast food joint. They buy something that's not good for them, cost more money and... Exactly. Not how easy is it that, you know, you go to Starbucks in the morning, I'm just going to get my latte. Oh, darn, I forgot to pack breakfast. So you grab a croissant or maybe a breakfast sandwich. That's gonna add up day after day. If we just take that extra time on the weekend, whatever day works best for you, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. You know, maybe you take some oatmeal, throw it in the fridge, add a little bit of milk, almond milk, water, whatever you like, throw on some berries, grab it in the morning, there you go. Yes. Add some cinnamon, sugar, like, Delicious. With meal prep, you can cook in larger batches and then freeze things and then just take it out, thaw it out, ready to go. Exactly. And shopping in season, does that matter? 100%. So by doing a quick Google search, you know, I'm located in X, what is in season for me right now? Go to the grocery store and those items, those fruits and vegetables specifically, are going to be a lot more cost effective. Now, some people, again, love certain fruits and vegetables, they wanna have it all year round. I say go to the frozen section. Go to the frozen section, don't be afraid of that. Just because, you know, say asparagus isn't in season, we know that that is gonna be very cost. So just costly. buy it frozen and you buy save some money. Exactly. Shannon, thank you so much for sharing your tips with us today. And viewers, we have some meal planning tips, resources, workbooks on our website. Stay tuned. Up next, find out if it's better to rent or buy a home. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. Thanks for your letters, emails, tweets, and messages. Today's question is from Wayne. Dear Sybil, 
I'm trying to decide if renting or buying is the best choice. I have enough for a down payment, but my mortgage payment would be higher than I pay in rent. Do you have any advice? Much appreciated, Wayne. Well, Wayne, congratulations on saving a down payment. I think purchasing is generally a good idea if you can afford it. Two things to think about. One is cash flow now, which you've already asked that question. Can you afford the monthly payments? Which we'll get to. But the second thing to consider is which is going to build your net worth over the long run. Well, we know when you're renting, you're not getting that back. It has zero impact on your net worth. So let me give you an example. If you were spending, say, $1,800 a month today on rent, and maybe you have enough to buy a $400,000 condo, your monthly payments might be around $2,500 a month for that condo to cover your mortgage, strata, insurance, and property taxes. So that's $700 a month more than you're paying now. But if you can afford to do it, your net worth will be so much further ahead in the long run. If we jump ahead 25 years, assuming just a modest 3% average increase in the value of real estate versus a 3% return on your money, if you invested that $700 a month instead of buying a place and putting it towards your mortgage, you would have $311,000 in 25 years versus your condo would be worth $837,000. So which would you prefer? If you can afford the cash flow, buy the condo. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping you make smart financial decisions. Join the Wealthy Life Club and you'll get access to everything you need to start living your version of The Wealthy Life.